How are you? Uh, well, first of all, I would like to introduce myself, in case you have missed that at uh, the restaurant in the morning. Uh, my name is Gabriel, I am from Argentina, and I am here to show you the project I have been working on for two years or so, and it is called Rich Objects. Oh, well, let's start. Well, our project is uh, a collection of software emulators. A software emulator, emulator uh, is a computer program that imitates the behavior or the functionality of an electronic device or another computer program. Uh, the most common types of emulators are those that imitate computers and video game consoles. And I think that it has to do with, with the fact that they let you run all software into modern computers. So, well, here we have two examples of emulators, you may know them. Uh, the one at the left is called DOSBox, and it is an emulator that imitates the behavior of a complete PC system. Uh, the game there is Prince of Persia, I don't know if you, <laughs> you know it. And at the right we have MAME, which is an emulator of arcade uh, video game machines. And the game is uh, Ghosts and Goals, I think. Well, uh, so at one point in time I decided to start writing my own emulator. And, uh, well, the Commodore 64 was the first computer that I had at home. So it was very easy to, to decide which computer to emulate. Uh, I'm curious about something. Can, can you raise your hands, uh, all of you who had used a C64, at least once? Oh. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, after the C64, my parents bought me a Nintendo Entertainment System, and as I, wa as I was having so much fun doing the C64 emulator, I decided to start a new one, which is for this machine. And while I was doing the two emulators, uh, I found that uh, there were a lot of things in common between the, the two emulators. Uh, so, at one point in time, I decided to start writing a framework for making emulators. And, uh, well, at this time, we would have only these two systems, but the idea of a framework is that uh, uh, we, we could make emulators for a lot of other systems using that framework. And, uh, well, I don't know, uh, possible candidates for the future are the Spectrum, and, well, the idea is that any, any system could be emulated with, with uh, retrojects. Well, uh, I will do a short demo, in case you haven't seen the, the application on Monday. Oh, let me find it. Well, this is the main interface of the emulators. Here at the right, at the left, you have the, the system, the implemented system, the Commodore 64 and the Nintendo. If we double click on the name of the system, ta -da! <laughs> well, this is the famous blue screen of the Commodore 64. And, uh, well, uh, let's play a game, that's the interesting stuff. Oh, I don't know, let's play. Impossible Mission. Do you know it? Or Gianna Sisters? Gianna Sisters. No? Outrun? Yeah. Yes, Outrun. Well, let's put, let's put that game. Oh. Well, let's change the game. <laughs> Those pussies were very common in the games. The cracking intros. Dedicated to all I didn't write that. to do is to configure the
<laughs> well, and the second emulator is of the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is the, the most uh, recent one, so it lacks a lot of features. But some games work. Wonder Boy? Do you know Wonder Boy? Sure. Yeah. Oh, we have to do the same with this. Interesting. So it has no sound, so it's a little boring, but... That's not Wonderboy. Oh, yes, it is Wonderboy. I mean, the guy. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to show you this, so you have an idea of what we're talking about. So let's go back to the slides. <laughs> the boring stuff, of course. Well, uh, someone here at the conference asked me twice why did I do that. <laughs> so, well, in first place, I I have noticed two things. The first one is that uh, people which choose statically typed languages for making emulators. Uh, the most common ones are C, uh, Assembler, Java. Uh, recently there are emulators that were being made in uh, .NET languages. But none of them uh, were made in dynamically typed languages. Are you, excuse me, are you saying that Assembler is statically typed? Uh, oh, oh, okay, uh, not Assembler. <laughs> I don't know how, how to categorize Assembler. It's nothing, it's uh, bytes. <laughs> well, and the, and the second thing that I noticed is that uh, people who are designing emulators uh, prefer uh, to do procedural designs and not object-oriented designs. And what they claim is that uh, object-oriented designs and, and uh, dynamic type languages uh, are slow for this kind of software. And emulators uh, there is a need for emulators to be fast because uh, what uh, someone that makes an emulator wants is that is to reach uh, the majority of people that it can so it can reach so so well uh, performance is of course something that you you need to think of uh, but what I asked myself was is it a, re a real problem nowadays because uh, now, uh, at this time, we have very fast computers, uh, we have virtual machines that, that have uh, just-in-time compilers, so, I don't know, I just wanted to, to try to see if these were still problems. So, what I wanted to accomplish with this? Well, the first thing is, uh, uh, I wanted to write everything in a small talk. Uh, well, in first place, because uh, it makes me very happy, <laughs> that's why there is a smile there. And also because I, uh, I was amazed by the idea of uh, when, when you have a model of a system uh, that, you did, uh, that you have the possibility to inspect the objects and tweak the stuff and, and everything. So, so, well, that's why I wanted to make, make everything in a small talk. Well, another goal is to uh, give priority to an object-oriented design, a nice design, and to think of performance, but at the end, at, at, at a later stage of development. Another goal uh, was to recreate the feeling of the original machines. Uh, to, to do that, we, you have to think of uh, that the emulated machine should run at the same speed as the original machine, uh, when you see graphic animations, you want it to, to go smooth and uh, if, the, origin, if the, the, the real computer had uh, a joystick, you want to, use a jo to be able to use a joystick. So, so the experience for the user is like playing on the original machine. Well, high quality emulation, uh, this is related to uh, how um, faithful are you at uh, in, uh, doing the simulation of the original machine. If you are uh, very faithful, uh, a consequence of that is that uh, 
more software that was made for that computer will, will also work in your emulator. And lastly, uh, I wanted to create a framework, uh, as I said, for making emulators of computers and, and video game consoles. So, how are the emulators made? Well, the first thing that, uh, that you have to do when you want to make an emulator is to identify the, the, the entities in the domain. In this case, uh, you should know uh, there you have the, the, the computer, the joystick, uh, the set tape recorder, uh, disk drive, television, okay, power supply, and all that. But then, if we only uh, model that uh, entities in, in, in the, in, into objects, uh, it will be very difficult to use the emulator because the only way to interface with that object is by sending messages, uh, by evaluating a small code or through inspector. So, you need to think about the, that things too. Okay, the the, um, the interface of, of the user. Uh, you want that when when the user presses a key on his keyboard, that it is transformed into a key press into the emulator machine, for example. So we have two groups of entities now: the the, the ones that uh, are for the system that you're going to emulate and the user uh, devices. But then you need some objects that do the actual conversion between the, the communication between those two worlds. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, well, the, the same example that I, uh, I gave with, with the keyboard. Uh, there you will have an object that uh, takes the event that uh, the key press of the user and uh, converts it into uh, a key press on the, on the keyboard of the C64. So. Uh, we have uh, three, three groups of entities. Let, let's go into the system model. <coughs> I'm going to divide these uh, elements, these entities, into four groups. The power supply, uh, the main unit, all the peripherals, and the software media. Yes? So, let's go with the power supply. Uh, as you know, every electrical device needs something that uh, that can give power to the to, to that hardware to that uh, device. So this is an uh, uh, an element, an entity that we must represent in a model. Well, it doesn't model actually uh, the, a power supply that you can see uh, everywhere uh, because it doesn't model electricity and that kind of stuff. It only uh, implements the concept of keeping alive an electrical device. Uh, well, uh, they work at a specified frequency. Devices can be plugged in or out for, from there. Um, well, this is more technical, but uh, I prefer to show you a real a, a running power supply, so you can see how it works. So here we have the C64, and oh. At the right, we have all the peripherals that are for the, for the select uh, machine system. So, let's go into the power supply. We have a user interface for it. As you can see, there is a list of the, the, the objects that are planned in uh, at that time. This is 64, a speaker, a TV, and uh, well, okay, uh, this, this object, don't, don't pay attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't be there. <laughs> Well, uh, this is not activated, I think, in this version, but you can plug and unplug things here. When you say plug, no, it's not implemented. But uh, when you say plug, it will pop up, uh, it will show a, a, a list of objects that are in the image, that are devices. So you can pick them, pick, pick it, and plug it. So, well, you can turn it off and turn it on. And another thing that is very cool to see, uh, let me find it, here. This is an intro. Well, it has very nice graphics and sound. But we, what we can do with the power supply is to 
make it work slower, faster. We can pause the emulation. <laughs> oh, this is a toy, of course. Okay, so let's turn it up. Okay, and this is the, the power supply. Well, next it comes the main unit. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, for this uh, on the Commodore 64. So, don't be scared. <laughs> uh, this is the, the a simplified version of the architecture of the Commodore 64. Oh, it's very simple. Uh, you have uh, the CPU. I mean, the power supply feeds with power to the, the, the CPU, it clocks the CPU at a specified frequency. The CPU is uh, always, at every cycle, uh, reading from memory and writing values to memory, yes? And that's the only way that the CPU has to communicate to other, uh, to other chips or other things that are living in, in, the, in, the, in the main world. Uh, well, that, that's not actually true, but uh, uh, in general terms it, it is. Uh, so, uh, immediately after the CPU we have the address decoder. Uh, the address decoder is uh, a special chip that uh, takes an address of memory and maps it to one of those chips. It could be a memory or it could be another of the, 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 the input-output chips, like the sound chip, the video chip. So that's the way that, uh, th that's how the CPU can communicate not only to main memory, but to the other chips that are in the system, okay? So, well, let's turn on the C64. I'm going to get into the machine. Here we have the interface for the C64. Oh, here it is. As you can see, all the all the user interfaces have an inspect button, so we can enter into the C64. Well, the C64 in in, the, uh, in this level of granularity uh, has the keyboard, uh, the LED. The, ma the motherboard, the motherboard is the one that, uh, that has all the chips on it and uh, well, something that is giving power at that time so we're interested in the motherboard so let's first change something in the main memory just because it's cool, I don't know self cut yes. one this address is the first character, the, 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 the character at the top left. So if we evaluate that, it, it appears an A. I don't know if you yeah. get to see it. And I had another example, but it was almost the same. What do you have done with the word space? Where is the word space? Oh, here it is. No. Okay, I don't know what I did with the workspace. I think I would better run this again. No, because I have I had examples to show you. Oh. No, I may have closed it without realizing. Here it is. Well, there is another example I, uh, I will show you because it's almost the same. It's to fill the screen with garbage by writing out several addresses, a random number or something like that. So, no, it doesn't matter. Well, for instance, let's try some, some other things like entering, uh, talking directly to the video chip. So, the motherboard, the big. It is the name of the chip. It's actually big too. Oh, the border generator. As you can see, there are lots of uh, the, the video chip uh, and all the chips are composed of more little objects. 
So here we can say we are at the, at the unit that generates the border, that you can see that is light, uh, light blue. So if you say self color 4, it changes to magenta, yellow. Okay. And another, another example is the sound chip. This is an interface for the sound chip that I made for testing purposes. <laughs> but it's very cool because you can control all the voices of the sound chip and the filters. So we can, for instance, we play with the frequency. Here we have the, the, the waveforms. This is the triangle. You have the sotu, pulse, which has this property and the noise. So it's a toy too. It's, it was only done for testing. But what's interesting is that uh, this uh, interface is uh, directly talking to the chip uh, by the means of uh, uh, writing to, it, uh, to its oh. registers. That, that was. But I didn't reach that part, yes. Oh, yes, of course. This is the sound chip. We have the voices. Uh, which part? The registers part? Or, I don't know. Voices. Let's go to the voice one. I don't know. Oh. Ah. Let's do this. So, this is the voice one. Yes. So, I'm going to enter the voice one. Here you have the tone oscillator, which is the, 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 the unit that generates the waveform which in this case is a triangle and uh, we can say here I think let me see if it was here oh, frequency, you can change the frequency I don't know so, oh, so. okay Let's return to the slides. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, so here we can identify these groups. We have memories, we have input output chips, we have the CPU with the address decoder, and we have uh, some chips that interface with the, the, the peripherals of the machine. Yes? Well, this is the Nintendo architecture, yes? They are pretty similar, if you see. Like this. Well, it also has memories, it also has input output chips, it has an address decoder, it has a CPU, it has peripherals. There are a lot of things in common between them. So, well, this is what I explained, it doesn't matter. Well, the next thing, thing that we have to model are the peripherals, yes? Oh, so, uh, let me go to uh, here. here uh, the first one that I'm going to show you is the data set. Okay? Data set or data set, I don't know how to pronounce it. So, do you remember loading tapes, those who use the C64? Those games uh, actually took two or three minutes to run. So, we can just say load, first play on tape. We can go to the data set. We can choose a tape here. I don't know, synapse? Yes. And we can play. So, it's very close to the real thing. I mean, you have to, to do it with a mouse, but. <laughs> There is this animation which turns the... Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to put the real cassette. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, while it's loading, I'm going to show you the, the interfaces. Oh, I forgot one thing. This, won't, this will not load because I used it 
At the morning, I, I did a rewind it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> let's power it off and on. Hello? Let me see, refresh. No, I don't know if I... I, I think... Oh, curious. <laughs> That should be emulated too. <laughs> Here are the flashing colors. <laughs> well, I will leave it in the background. So, let's make it. What does the generate wave button do? Uh, sorry? Oh! This is very interesting. You can actually convert it, the, 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 this tape, into an audio a WAV file in this case, and if you record that audio into a real cassette and you put that cassette into the real machine, it will work. <laughs> <laughs> yes? It's possible to interrupt your relative to the real hardware? Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Oh, no, 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 to the real hardware, no, no. No, the only way to communicate this emulator with the real hardware is for the sound. There, there is a, rubber, a, a library that lets you uh, nothing, uh, connect the, your computer, uh, the one that, that is running the emulator, to a real Commodore 64, and the sound will be produced by the, by the real sound chip. And it's working. <coughs> well, it will be. So, the other user interfaces are the joystick, this is very useless. Oh. This one is useless, but it's cool, I don't know. Ah, I, I, I did a click on the button and it worked. <laughs> so, we have the joysticks, the power supply, we have the speaker. The speaker is very simple, it only has a volume uh, control and nothing more. Eventually, it could be uh, you, you could add uh, trebles, bass, and all that things. You have the TV. Eventually, it will have uh, brightness, controls, and contrast. I don't know. Still there. Okay. Well, this one doesn't matter. So, oh. well, it loaded, so I, I have to play. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 let's, I don't know how am I with, with time, but I, I think, uh, so, well, the media, uh, there are a lot of kinds of media, uh, the diskettes, the, 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 the cartridges, the tapes, uh, the tapes are the only one that currently are regulated at 100%, uh, the cartridges of the C64 are regulated, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, um, not not very well, <laughs> and there is no support for discs by now. But I really want to implement discs and the disc drive on C64 because there were lots of games that were uh, for that kind of media. So uh, I would like to to do some more things with uh, to show you the the video system how it works, uh, the the audio system and the input system. So, in this uh, diagram, uh, what you can see is, um, well, the video system. <laughs> and um, the way it works is, uh, is like this. Uh, the video chip generates video in the same way that the television does. It is from left, uh, drawing pixels from left to right and from top to bottom. Okay? So, what the, the, the video chip is doing uh, all the time is drawing this until it fills a complete frame. Okay? So, uh, the video chip, what, what the video chip does is to uh, write the, draw those pixels into a frame buffer until the frame buffer is full. Okay? The, 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 a complete frame has been drawn. Uh, it actually doesn't uh, output uh, color pixels, RGB values. It only stores 
uh, color indexes. Okay, that was a very common thing in, in all computers. So once that the frame buffer is complete, it is passed to a color generator which takes those color indexes and translates them into RGB values, okay, to be shown on the screen. And you can optionally have a converter which is a kind of video filter for, uh, I don't know, so if, if you zoom in, maybe you don't want to see blocks, the pixels in blocks, you maybe want to apply some kind of filter so it looks more like on a real television set. And so, well, uh, when the picture is complete, it is sent to the TV. The TV may apply some transformation, uh, I don't know, brightness, or the ones that I told you. And, well, we have the image. What I wanted to show you here was two examples. How much time is left? Is anyone... no? Why? Well, doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, so what I wanted to show you here was... Uh, well, how is it? We dropped it. Okay, here it is. So again, we will open the C64. We're going to the video chip. Okay. So the video chip. Uh, well, I think I'm going to skip this because in five minutes it's. Short time. So, the audio system. Uh, it's very like uh, it's like the video system. You have some uh, some power source that uh, is power to the sound chip. Uh, the sound chip only uh, the only thing that it has to do is to generate uh, samples, okay? And uh, the samples are uh, given to a speaker. The picture the, the speaker is uh, is constantly receiving those samples and they are output through, the, through your speakers through an external interface. Well, so, why yes. does it say that the developer only needs to... Oh, okay, it was also here. Uh, those things that are in, in a red box are the things that the, 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 the developer that wants to make an emulator has to worry about. Okay. You provide the other ones? Okay, exactly, yes. <coughs> And in this case, it is the same. And you can that the for the 1264 and the... Exactly, exactly. The two emulators are using this uh, structure. Okay. Uh, well, not, not this one because it has no sound. The Nintendo one has no sound yet. And, uh, well, I, I want to show you uh, an example of this. To, to, to show you how easy it is to uh, generate sound. What I'm going to do is to, oh, where is it? I'm lost. Oh, I think I closed the objects, yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, let's open this, let's go to the speaker, let's inspect it, and we can evaluate this. What I'm doing here, if you see this message, is I'm, I'm telling the, the, the speaker to receive a sample, okay? And what I'm doing here is to generate uh, 50,000 times a random sample, okay? So when we evaluate this, we hear white noise. Okay? So we, what you only have to do is this, to send a sample or a sequence of samples and it will be reproduced or uh, played in immediately. Okay, so uh, let's go faster. Uh, the input system, uh, the, uh, very, very quickly, the user presses a key, so it's, uh, it is catched by the, the an external interface. Then you have in the model a representation of the keyboard of the user, and the, that catches that event too, and that event, the key press, is passed to the adapter. The adapter is the one that I told you uh, earlier, that uh, takes that event and converts it into an action in the model, okay? So in this case, the adopter says, oh, the AK key was pressed, so let's press the key at the keyboard, okay? So, uh, we have external interfaces, okay? So the, we have, uh, uh, we need a way to communicate to, with the, 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 the devices of the user, okay? 
So what I'm using, uh, what I'm using are these libraries for sound I'm using F mode X for uh, SDL and OPGL for video, SDL and XFFD for 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 the input. The, the second one is one that lets you uh, control the vibration of the joystick that support them. So it's, it, it is very experimental, but the idea is that uh, uh, we can associate uh, special events in the emulators to vibrations. So it's it's cool. I don't know. <laughs> oh, uh, and thank you, Michael, for doing the, the wrappers for for these these libraries. <laughs> very useful. So well, and then we have the objects that, that act as bridges. Uh, well, uh, one of the, the one of these objects is are the loaders. Uh, the loaders are uh, objects that take a file from the file system. Uh, it could be a game that you have downloaded from the internet, for instance, and it converts in the, these bytes that are stored in the file into a real object, so representing the disk or the cassette tape or whatever. Okay, so this th that media once it is converted, it is kept in the image. Okay, so you don't don't need the file anymore. When you close the, the, the interface and you open it again, it will persist. Well, the adapters again and the user interfaces. Well, there are lots of things that could be reused. Okay, so well, there are some of the, some some of the abstractions that are made in the framework are the concept of devices. The devices are things that can be turned on, turned off, and are connected, can be connected and disconnected from into a power supply. Uh, input output chips, all the input output chips has an interface based on registers, okay? And the scheduling process, which is uh, a process to, to clock. Uh, do you remember that the computer had lots of chips? Well, each of them has to be clocked at a regular rate, okay? So the scheduling uh, takes care of this, because um, on reality, uh, on the real life, uh, we have all things uh, occurring uh, in parallel, it's, uh, in, a, in a concurrent way, but we don't have this here. So, well, components, this is a list of components, I think that when, when, when the slides are uploaded you can check, it, check it, this list uh, again. Well, another thing that I really want to do are to make more tools for, for the framework. Uh, there are not many right now, but what I what really want to accomplish is to have uh, that the development of uh, the, the, the development of an emulator uh, to 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 make it easy doing less programming. Uh, what I have in mind is a kind of a desktop where you have uh, graphics that represent the objects and you can. Just throw a wire a one object with another one, and to make to to, to make systems in a more uh, visual way. I don't know how to express it. So the conclusions: small tech can, small tech can do that. Uh, well, the small tech environment is ideal for modeling hardware. That that is because if we see uh, other environments that are more uh, static where you have a runtime and a development time uh, the thing is that your objects only live uh, during the, the runtime you run the application, your objects, your objects are created, they live, but when the application is over they die so the, there is no persistence and in a small talk it's like real life, you have the objects, you work with them you have access to them er everywhere or anywhere you, you want and so on. Well, and the last conclusion was that uh, some, something that really helped me to, to make the balance between uh, uh, an object-oriented design and performance is to use the profiler. Okay? Uh, most of the time that I use the profiler and I, find, I found a bottleneck, uh, I realized that that bottleneck was on a, on a part of the, of the emulator that uh, is very low level or it doesn't need a, a, a good design or Things like that. For instance, uh, I remember one, uh, once uh, what happened was that uh, I was um, putting the graphics uh, on the screen by software. 
So when I when I when I saw that, what I did was to uh, get OpenGL and try to that uh, to do that in hardware, okay? And that uh, in, it increased the, the, the performance by a lot, a lot. So and that's not something that is not something that has to do with the real modeling of the computers. So what I would like to do next is the now one. Well, the first thing is to make it cross-platform. Uh, it only works on Windows and VisualBox 7.6 for Windows. Uh, 7.6 if you want to use the development image, uh, there is also a runtime image on the website of the project that, that you can run standalone. But I think it should be very easy to do this port for Mac and Linux because uh, the, 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 the libraries are already ported. So. Well, keep improving the emulators, keep evolving the framework. Uh, documentation, I need to write lots of documentation. Uh, make some tests, they are handy. And well, to make more emulators. So, any questions? <laughs> yes. Of course. How is, that, how is that implemented, all the, all the instructions? Of course. Let me search for it. Well, I will use this opportunity to show you how it's organized. Uh, you have a bundle that is root objects, okay? So we have a bundle for hardware, okay? Here it lays the, the CPU, all the input output chips, the media. Uh, the power supply, counter switches, all of the objects, okay? So let's go to the CPU, we have the chips, and we have two CPUs implemented. They are actually very similar, okay? So, if we see this CPU, this is the one that the Nintendo use. This is the main object, the object that represents the, the, the whole CPU, okay? This is the name of the CPU, of course. But then, if, you, if we go to the instance variables, we will see that it is composed of more units. Yes? The control unit, the execution unit, an interrupt logic, a counter that counts the clocks that are elapsed, and the memory, a reference to the memory, so it can write to them and read from, read from it. So, uh, I don't know, if we go to the control unit, we have objects, the object for the control unit, we have the instructions, the opcodes, uh, the control unit can be activated and deactivated, so it, the, the states are also reified. Uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, the execution unit, we have an exception value operation, an object for the registers. Uh, how, how, how does does it work? I mean, how does the CPU oh. work? Uh, internally? Yeah. Okay, we have, you have the, the, the two units, the, the, the control unit and the execution unit, and they work together to execute the instructions. Uh, I'm not going to show you here because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's long, okay. but <laughs> it takes so uh, some message, time. Uh, what message do you Oh, the first message that the, that the CPU receives yeah. is clock. It can be clocked by one, t one time or more than one time. And every time it receives that message, what does it do? Uh, the, the, the CPU, what, what's doing, what, what it's doing all the time is executing instructions. Okay. Okay? Each instruction uh, takes a certain amount of cycles. For instance, if you have to store, the, store volume memory, it, it will take, say, I don't know, three clocks. Okay? Maybe in the first clock it takes it fetches the instruction and the second the second one it takes the operands and so on. But but you always have these two uh, these stages: one for fetching the operand, the instruction, the operands, and uh, an execution part, the part in which uh, the instruction is uh, the action of instruction is executed. So this is the CPU is modeled uh, at uh, at the finest granularity. Okay, we can. Uh, I could have done a, a, a CPU emulation that interprets instruction by instruction. Okay, 
But uh, I, I really wanted to, to make the, the, the model of the CPU as close as possible to the real chip. And the real chip is clocked uh, at once, or, uh, every clock. Okay? So uh, the, the bad part of this is that it is uh, less intu intuitive. Intuitive, less intuitive. Because if you look at the sheet of, uh, uh, the, 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 um, of the instructions of the CPU, uh, you will find what an instruction does. Uh, the, the, for instance, it takes the, the, this register and this register, do an addition and put the result here. Well, when you debug this, you will have, if that instruction takes four cycles, to find out what is happening, you have to uh, clock four cycles and do all the process of clocking uh, and see what's happening. It, it's not as immediate as, well, execute the, the next instruction and you have the code of the instruction right on one method, okay? But that is uh, uh, another way of implementing a CPU. Uh, one method for each instruction and that method includes all that it ha would have to do if, if the, 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 the cycles were put together into a into a method. Yes. Did you also model the instructions? Oh, sorry. Did you also model the instruction on a one by one level? So that's like I describe it in the instruction, and that it, it takes the blocks and moves that the instruction itself. Oh, sorry, I, I don't understand. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, let me see. Instructions. Here we have the instructions. Well, they actually, uh, for, uh, this is uh, one of the places where I had to do some, uh, something special, some tricks for, for the question of performance. So, an instruction is basically a list of selectors, and uh, each selector is uh, a reference to a method that um, performs what it has to perform on that specific cycle. I don't know if I... Uh, uh, yes. Oh, I think... Oh, I don't know if it's back, but... Uh, well, with the CPU we have this problem of the granularity that makes it very... But, uh, I don't know, let's, let's try. But, but I mean, the is the an assembly instruction or is it an micro instruction? Oh, it's an assembly instruction. Okay. It's, a, it's a set of uh, micro instructions. Okay. Well, each selector, uh, ha each instruction has a, a, a collection of micro uh, of selectors of, that correspond to micro instructions. Okay. Well, micro exactly. Exactly. When you create these instructions, so that you can show less where you create instances of each instruction. Now we can see. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's see. So that. Uh, let's maybe put the breakpoint. Maybe inspect the CPU. Doesn't the CPU pass a list of all the instructions? Or, oh, or not? Uh, control unit. Let me see. I, I don't remember. Uh, special instructions. Create instructions by your code. Here uh, we have all the instructions. Okay, I don't. I am not showing this in the inspector because they are local. Okay, they are put on an array of, of codes. But here, here we have one. For instance, we have ADC. I don't know what it does. I don't remember. Uh, admin curry. Yes, yes, that's it. So you have to... Uh, uh, the instruction can be uh, categorized into those that read from memory, those that read and modif modify the value and write them back to, the, to a position in memory, those that don't do any of that. Okay, so uh, the, the, type, the type of instruction uh, uh, defines part of the micro instruction uh, uh, of the micro instructions that it uses. For instance, uh, a reading, uh, uh, an instruction that reads, has always 
for example, the same two first micro instructions, okay? And uh, well, I don't know. And is the ADC a method or, or just a name? Oh yes, ADC because um, ADC has to do some logic. Let, let, let's find it. ADC. Yeah. So, well, uh, this one is implemented uh, in. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, ADC. Add with carry. It sums the the, the the accumulator by another number plus the carry state bit. And it sets, set, sets the, the, the flags and then does something different depending on the, the CPU had two states, uh, one for decimal mode and one for not decimal mode. It doesn't set the current class. Uh, sorry? It doesn't set the current class. Uh, no, maybe, maybe this is doing that. I have to check that. At decimal, let's see. Uh, this is very heavy code, but this was it. <laughs> yes, yes. Very low level stuff here. Yes, here it says the curry. <laughs> and add not decimal, let's find it. Add not decimal. Oh, this is simpler. But there are things that, when, when you read the documentation of the instructions, you find these things and you have no other way to implement them. You, you have to make this XOR, this other thing, a bit and a number, but well, it works. So actually it's not enough that you have a physical C64. You oh, no, no. All the manuals of Oh, course. yes, yes. Uh, I was about six months reading and reading again and again and again until I understand all the, the instructions and how it worked and the sound check, the video chip. Uh, you have to be really patient for that. <laughs> yes. yes it's, it's very time consuming also. You should have started with a Z80 or a Z81. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> too many chips. <laughs> oh, yes. No, no, that was really... Really hard, but the result is very good. I, I'm very happy with it. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, have you planned if you're going to uh, release it open source? Oh, yes, it, it is under the MIT. Uh, it, is a, it has a web page, you can download it from it. There are two versions. Uh, the runtime version, which is uh, the, the two versions are the same, but one is the development, the complete development image. And the other one is uh, uh, an executable version. But yes, you can download it. You you, you have to. You will need uh, VisualWorks seven uh, six and Windows, and you're wrong with that. Right? You don't need uh, anything else. Any special libraries? Uh, no, no, they are all in the, in the package. Exactly. Yes, yes. <coughs> Oh, any other questions? No? Does your uh, Commodore 64 boot squeak nose? <laughs> <laughs> That's a squeak nose okay, boot. Uh, <laughs> 64? I couldn't find it when I for it's Commodore 64. Yes? When did you learn small talk? Oh, uh, when? He was my teacher, he was the one who, or none, have not read this. Oh, do some five, six, six, I don't know, three years ago, yeah, more years or less. Uh, I finished the courses and uh, I was amazed with a small talk. I wanted to do a big project, so I did this. <laughs> and I learned a lot with this. Uh, I mean, this is very low level stuff. But the, the, I wanted to, to taste the two things, I mean, uh, the, the doing low-level stuff into a, a, using high-level uh, decisions. Or, or, so, so once you have, you, you learn to make the, the balance between those, those things, it's, you enjoy it. I mean, you can do level stuff, like low-level stuff in, in a high-level environment, and it's great. Because it, it lets you do this kind of things like uh, getting into with inspectors or things like that. Yes.
was it a factor in you deciding to take on this project that you, you perhaps never heard, oh, no, no, that, would that be, that's impossible? Oh, no, no. I, I, uh, I don't know, I, I, uh, I'm always uh, open-minded to that, that, that kind of thing. If someone tells me you, it is impossible to do this on dynamically typed languages or it will work like a crap or, or those kind of things, uh, I, I don't care, I, I, I just... Uh, if I think that I have to give it a try or I think it is possible, uh, well, I go ahead. So. That's not being open-minded, that's being Hard head. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to download it, or you can Google for two objects or check the ESAG web page. Okay, that was it. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>